Chapter 28 I was about to enter the pack house with my children, only to come face to face with a very pissed off Gavin. He was about to say something when Eric started fussing in my arms. I tried to calm him down by cooing a little as Gavin's attention snapped to the children and his eyes softened and he smiled at the kids. We need to talk later. He mind-linked me. No, we don't. I mind-linked back, and he sent a glare my way. Yes, we do, Anna. We need to talk about you going out when you should have been taking rest. He said firmly, and I rolled my eyes at his concern, because I know better than that. I am not answerable to you. Now, if you would excuse me, I have to take my kids home. I said and he snapped his attention to me and the kids with wide eyes. Your kids? You mean you adopted them? He asked, his excitement evident in his voice. Yes, I did, I replied, and before we could say anything else, I felt Erica tugging my hand to get my attention. She was looking at me with curiosity in her eyes. Mommy, who is that? She asked, and before I could even open my mouth to respond, Gavin beat me to it. I am your daddy, little princess. Your mommy's mate, he said with a big grin in his face, as Erica looked at me as if she wanted to confirm and give her permission to talk to him. Yes, sweetie, that's your daddy. She smiled big at my response as Gavin walked to us, kneeling in front of the girl his smile never leaving his face as he looked at her with so much awe. Will you love us like mommy? She asked with so much hope and what seems like excitement. Of course, I will love you, little princess. You are a pretty little thing, aren't you? He said as he looked at her with adoration in his eyes, giving her a kiss on her forehead, and she giggled loudly at his words as her eyes lit up like a Christmas tree. Mommy says that too, she said, and he smiled at her, picking her up in his arms. And who is this? he asked, as he looked at Eric with curious eyes. He is my baby brother Eric, she answered with a smile. Eric is a nice name, and what is your name, little princess? He asked with a smile on his face. My name is Erica, she said, and he nodded his head with a smile. And before any of us could say anything, the truck pulled up in the driveway with everything we shopped. The truck driver walked out and bowed his head to us, greeting us. Is that my stuff or the betas? I asked. This is your stuff, Alpha. Beta stuff is arriving in the other truck, he said, and I nodded my head as Dan and Bria drove up with their daughter. Okay, take all the stuff to the ninth floor. There is a room adjoined to the master bedroom. Keep everything there and send someone to help set up the room, I said, and he nodded, walking away, bowing his head. Took you both long enough? I asked, looking at Bria and Dan. Brielle wanted to have ice cream, so we made a pit stop. Bria answered, and I smiled as Brielle looked at me with a sheepish smile. It's okay, Brielle. You can ask anything you want from them. I'll tell you a secret later about your daddy, okay? I said, and she jumped in excitement, making all of us laugh at her cuteness. You know I have some of your secrets, too, Dan said with a smirk. And I laughed at him. Yes, you do, but I don't have anything embarrassing. However, you do, he said, and he groaned. Wait, you knew too and didn't tell me about it? Gavin asked as he looked at Dan with accusing eyes. I didn't know that I had to ask you for your permission to adopt a child, he said with sarcasm dripping from his voice, making Bria and I roll our eyes. 
I think you should keep your personal discussions for later when the children are not around. I said, challenging them to say otherwise, and their eyes immediately softened at the sight of the girls looking at them with confusion swirling in their eyes. Let's go inside. I am sure the kids are tired and hungry. I'll make them food, I said, as the girls jumped in excitement, asking for pasta. I smiled at them, walking to the elevator. Leah, I have asked them to deliver my stuff to the ninth floor. Tell me which room do you want us to take? Dan asked as he looked at me. Come on, Dan. Take any room you like. Oh, there were adjoining rooms in front of the master's bedroom. It's just as big as the master bedroom. Take that one. It will be easy for you to get to Brielle whenever she needs you. You can design the adjoining room for her, I said, and Bria smiled. That's a great idea, Anna. I think that way we will be there for you as well, and the kids will love to have each other's company. She replied, and I nodded with a smile on my face. Wait, you're shifting to the ninth floor as well? Gavin asked, shocked, and I glared at Dan to stop his sarcastic answer in front of the kids. Yeah, Steve and Cy will stay on your floor. We didn't want to leave Leah alone, so we decided we would stay with her. He answered with a calm voice but he did nothing to mask the anger in his eyes. Mommy? Erica called out, looking at me in question. I smiled as I looked at her, making herself comfortable in Gavin's arms, playing with the collar of his shirt. Yes, sweetie? I asked. Will Daddy not stay with us? She asked, and my chest tightened at her question. Chapter 28 Part B No, sweetie. Daddy will be staying on the floor above us, and you can go see him any time you want, I said with a small smile, and she smiled brightly at my answer. Really? She asked, and I nodded my head with a smile as Gavin relaxed his stiff posture. I might hate him for what he did, but I would not want my children to see him as a bad man. I know they will eventually understand things growing up, but I don't want to be the one to put things in their mind. They should be able to live their childhood in peace, and most importantly, there are parents who look after their children together as co-parents after they split up. We can be co-parents for them, but nothing more than that. We walked into the ninth floor, the staff from the store were moving and setting up in the adjoining room from my bedroom to make it a nursery for the kids. One of the staff walked up to me, asking if I want the room to be painted as well, and I told them that I want to paint one side of the nursery in a light shade of pink for my princess and the other side in a light shade of blue for my little prince. I didn't have time or I would set up the nursery for the children myself. Maybe I can do something for their rooms once they grow, which is a good couple of years from now. I gave them instructions about how I wanted things to look like as they noted them down and moved to work. All of us walked to my bedroom, and I gently laid Eric down, building a wall of pillows around him. I know he is very small to even move around on his own, but it's better safe than sorry. I gave him a kiss on his forehead as both the girls jumped out of their daddy's arms, sitting beside Eric, making him giggle as they made funny faces. I am going to cook pasta. Do you want me to cook anything else? I asked. No, I think pasta is good enough. I will order some pizza. Steve and Cy would be arriving here at any moment, she said, and I smiled moving to the kitchen as Bria took out her phone to call for pizza. I felt Gavin walking to the kitchen behind me as I ignored his presence. Anna, don't you think we need to talk? He said, standing behind me. We have nothing to talk about, I said as I moved around gathering things I would need to make the pasta. Yes, we do, 
he said, grabbing my arm, turning me around as he pulled me to his chest, wrapping his arms around me. I felt the electricity running through my body as sparks erupted at his touch. My body may react to the mate bond, but I am not giving in to it. I know what he is trying to do here, and I jerked, pushing him away from me as he looked at me with sad eyes. No, we don't have anything to talk about. I have said everything that I have to tell you, and now there is nothing left between us. I may carry your mark, but I am not your mate. You are free to do anything you want, and so am I. And as far as the children's concerned, we are just two people, co-parenting them. I would have never let you get involved with the children, but you are their father as per werewolf law. I can't take their father's love away from them, and I trust you only enough to know that you will fulfill your responsibilities as their father. I don't want or know anything else, I said with finality as we stood there with an emotionless face, and at this point I could care less about anything he does. Now, if you will, please excuse me, I have to cook, I said as I started working on the pasta. I am trying very hard to not let my emotions surface, and so far I have been successful. The only reason he affects me so much is because I trusted him, loved him, and because the mate bond is still there. I know Brian is innocent, and he keeps trying to talk sense into Gavin, but he never listens. I know Elsa and Brian are the ones suffering the most because of what Gavin did. They both love each other and have been waiting to show their love and affection for each other, but I can't do anything to help them because I can't stay with a person who is not loyal to me or doesn't even love me. My eyes filled with tears, and I blinked my eyes to keep them from spilling out of my eyes. I felt Gavin walk away from the kitchen, and I ignored every emotion I felt and focused on making food for the kids. It took me a good twenty-five minutes to cook the pasta. I took the food to the dining table, informing everyone that the food is ready. I set the dining table up as Bria walked with pizza boxes, Gavin and Dan walking with the girls in their arms, and Steve and Cy behind them with Eric. I smiled at them, thankful that they got Eric with them, and moved to the kitchen to make the formula for him. Once I was done, I took my son from Steve's arms and sat down in my chair, feeding Eric. Dan and Gavin had girls in their laps as their chairs were not unpacked yet. Everyone started eating their food. As Eric finished his, I gently rubbed his back, burping him and cleaning his face once he puked a little. I rocked him gently in my arms, lulling him to sleep, and walked to my room, placing him on the bed with a pillow wall intact. I walked out of the room to the dining table as the girls said they liked the pasta very much and others were busy eating their food. Once all of us were done eating, we thought it was a good time for introductions so the kids knew everyone. Erica, sweetie, do you want to know who everyone around is? I asked, and she nodded her head. Sweetie, you already know Daddy. His name is Gavin. That is your Uncle Dan, and she's your Aunt Bria. There is Uncle Steve, and that is Aunt Cy. I introduced everyone, and she waved her hand saying hi with a shy smile as everyone smiled back at her with a greeting. Brielle, baby, come here. Bria called as her daughter jumped off her father's lap, running to her mother. Baby, you already know me and your daddy, right? Bria asked, looking at her daughter, and she nodded her head. Good. That is your Aunt Anna, and that is your Uncle Gavin. He is Uncle Steve and his mate Aunt Cy. There in Aunt Anna's lap is your cousin Erica, okay? Bria asked as Brielle nodded her head enthusiastically. Mommy, I'm tired, my daughter said, rubbing her eyes adoringly 
and I smiled at how cute she looked. Okay, sweetie, I think we should all go to bed, I said, getting up with Erica in my arms. I walked up to my bedroom, placing her on the bed, covering her with a duvet as she yawned immediately, falling asleep. I walked out to see Steve and Sai walking upstairs as Dan and Bria entered their bedroom with their daughter. Gavin walked up to me, entering the bedroom and kissing both Erica and Eric. We walked up to the door of my bedroom, where I was waiting for him, so I could close the door once he is out. He looked at me for a few minutes, as if expecting me to say something, and when I didn't, he walked out of the room with a sigh. I closed the door to my room, making sure the kids were comfortable. I lay down on the bed, closing my eyes, drifting to a peaceful slumber with my arms secured around my kids. Chapter 29 Gavin's Point of View After my mate walked out of my room, breaking ties with a pack as their Luna, I was very angry and walked to the gym to burn the pent-up anger. I worked out in the gym by lifting weights, running on the treadmill as fast as I could, doing push-ups, and finally, boxing, breaking the bags. My knuckles turned red when I was done, and the soreness did nothing to ease the empty feeling I had in my heart. Brian was whimpering continuously in my head, triggering a headache. I sighed and walked back to the bedroom that I will have to use alone from now on. I entered the bathroom, stripping myself and turning the shower on. I adjusted the temperature and allowed the warm water to relax my stiff muscles. I stood in the water thinking about everything that happened so far and what I can do to make it better. I couldn't think straight and there was a nagging feeling in my heart as if something bad is about to happen. What more was left to happen? I don't know. I pushed the feeling at the back of my mind as I had more pressing issues to look at because the rogues and vampires are looming around and we don't know what they are looking for. I sighed washing my body, shampooing and conditioning my hair. I turned the shower off, walking out, and drying myself with a warm towel. I walked into my walk-in closet, pulling out a pair of silk boxers and a pair of clothes. I wore the boxer pulling out the red button-down shirt and black dress pants. I walked up to the mirror, blowing my hair dry and gelling it up properly. Once I was done, I walked out of my room to the office. I entered my office and completed the paperwork. I remember that we have to discuss about threats of rogues and vampires, so I quickly mind-linked Dan, asking him to come to my office. I pulled out the map circling the areas where they have been spotted and realized that they are looming around more in our packed territories, targeting the smaller ones and taking them down as if they are trying to gain strength. With all the recent attacks on the nearby packs, and them being spotted on our land, indicated that the rogues and vampires might be working together, which means that it is more dangerous than it looks. We need to find out what they are looking for. That may help us take them down. We have to protect our pack and keep them safe. I am sure the packs who are still under the threat would want to help us to keep themselves safe. I heard a knock on the door, and I knew it was Dan. He never used to knock before entering my office, but it seems like things have changed. I heaved a sigh, as if I felt the weight of everything happening for the last few days on my shoulders. I know it's you, Dan. Come on in. I answered, and he entered my office. Alpha, you called? He asked, bowing his head slightly, speaking professionally. Dan, I know things have changed, and what I want to say may not matter to you. I started taking a deep breath, recalling why I had called him in. Anyways, I called you to talk about the looming threats of rogues and vampires. 
I don't know, but for some reason, I am having a feeling that they might be working together. Because with the way they are being spotted together, attacking smaller packs, I think they are trying to strengthen themselves. I strongly believe they want something, or someone, and they are preparing themselves to get what they want. We might have a war on the way, and we don't even know what we are fighting for. I said, as Dan sat across from me, looking at the map as he processed what I said. I think you are right about that, Alpha. But what do we do now? They have been spotted on our lands, and they haven't attacked us yet, he said with a faraway look. We need to find out what they want. Did we capture any rogues or vampires after they were spotted together? I asked, and he shook his head. No, Alpha. We have a couple of rogues in the dungeons, but they were captured before they started looming around with those bloodsuckers, and we have already investigated them, but they know nothing. The strange part is, from the time we started spotting vampires and rogues together on our lands, they have either escaped before the border patrol can catch them, or they created situations where they don't get captured, but get killed instead. Now that I think about it, they might be doing it on purpose, so we don't find out what they are up to, and since we increased the patrol on both the territories, we have spotted them looming outside the borders. They haven't even once tried to enter our land. It's like they know they would get caught, and maybe they are trying to observe us to find a loop, so they can enter our lands again. Dan said, and he was making sense. How the fuck did we miss to see that? Call the rogues who work for us, and ask them to secretly find out information. Tell them not to come here, and just have them pretend that they hate us. Get our best trackers ready. Ask them to find out their location, and every other detail they can find out. And please tell them that every little detail counts. We can't miss anything, or think any detail is less important. I said and he nodded his head. Contact all the Alphas for a meeting on Monday. We will have to work together, because we don't know what we are dealing with here. Share every information with Anna once she resumes her duties tomorrow. Increase the training of the warriors and start self-defense training for the teens and women. Start filling all the safe houses with supplies. We don't know when the war may start and ensure the safe houses are fully secured to keep the elders, kids, and whoever is not able to fight safe. Also, inform every pack member that if they find anything out of the ordinary, or if they have doubts on anyone, they should report it immediately to the leaders from both the packs. I instructed, trying to think if I am missing anything. Yes, Alpha. Is there anything else? He asked when I shook my head no. He bowed his head in respect, walking out of my office. I don't know what to do, because I am really trying hard right now, and the only thing I want is to have my mate in my arms. Am I really wrong to think that I can't be happy without having multiple women in my life? Can I not see things the way everyone else is see? Can I not be happy with only my mate in my life? Why couldn't I stop myself from touching the she-wolves the other day? It's not like she was beautiful, because no one is as beautiful as my mate is. Then why did I fuck someone else? Ugh, why the hell am I feeling bad? Why do I feel the guilt weighing down on me, when I thought it was okay for me to be with other women, even after finding my mate, I didn't feel anything wrong? then why do I feel like I have done the biggest mistake in my life? Because you love your mate, you dumbass. Brian growled at me, making my eyes widen. The love? I questioned, not believing and stuttering in the process. How can I be in love with her? Sure, she is my mate. She is strong, smart, beautiful, loving caring, and everything. But am I really in love with my mate? I don't know. 
I have been feeling a lot of things lately, but I told myself that it is not my fault, but I am just not able to put away the guilty feeling I am getting. You are guilty because you know you are wrong. You know you are a dumb ass, Brian muttered, rolling his eyes at me. He has always been the one to oppose almost everything I do, but he has been more expressive about things since we found our mate. I think he doesn't remember that we are supposed to be one team. I know he may be right sometimes, and he makes me want to strangle him for not being there for me. I heard that, he growled. You were meant to, you smartass, I answered, and he growled a low warning, making me roll my eyes. If you don't make things right with our mate, I am seriously going to leave you alone forever, he warned. I know you are serious about that, Brian, but I don't know what to do, I said, and he groaned. Start with being honest and apologize, he said, making a sigh leave my lips. <sighs> I don't know, Brian. A part of me says what I did was wrong, and there is another part in me making me feel that it's not. I am literally torn in between. I am lost between what is right and what is wrong. But I know one thing for sure that I want Anna more than anything I want in my life. I never thought I would ever feel something like this for my mate, but I long to have her near me, to get her to touch me and kiss me, I said, and I couldn't believe my ears, because I actually feel and sound sad. What the hell is happening with me? Chapter 30 Gavin's Point of View It has been a few hours after my meeting with Dan. I have been on the phone getting things arranged for the upcoming meeting. Dan has sent the scouts and trackers to get the location or any information about what the rogues are doing with vampires together. I don't know, but I have been having this feeling that whatever it is, I am not going to like it. I have been locked inside my office trying to get my work done and deal with all the new emotions and feelings that have surfaced. I am trying to understand how to deal with them, express them. I have been thinking about things I can do to convince my mate. I am still not sure what I am going to say to her because I know the only thing that can get my mate back in my arms is honesty and commitment but I don't know if I can live up to her expectations. I have to sort my feelings out first. I have to know what is happening with me. Maybe that can help me get the answer I need. I took a deep breath, trying to calm myself down. It has just been a few hours since Anna moved out, and I can barely think about anything else other than her. I have to find her, at least see her, I know that she is fine. I got up and walked to her office opposite to mine to see if she is there. To my surprise, the room that was once her office and completely filled with files, books, pack history, etc. is now just an empty room. She did say that she wanted to be away from me, but I didn't know she would change her office as well. I walked out of the now empty room, feeling disappointed. I climbed down the stairs and walked to the office on the ninth floor to find it empty with her scent fading away. I sighed, walking to the master's bedroom on the floor. I knocked on the door a couple of times, but there was no response from the other end. I looked around the entire floor and felt more at home the feeling I once used to get with my mate when we were together. I didn't know I ever felt this with her until this day. I was getting frustrated from being away from her, and her getting a response was now getting on my nerves, slowly turning into a fear that my mate might be in danger. I immediately opened the door, 
walking inside the room to find the bed empty. As panic started creeping in, I walked towards the bathroom to find the door open and sneaked in to find it completely empty. I walked out of the room searching for her and the other rooms coming up empty. I knew trying to ask Bria or Dan would result in nothing, and Sai is my only option, although a difficult one. I tried to mind-link her, but got no response from her. She seemed to have blocked all the links. I was even tempted to force a link to know about the whereabouts of my mate, but decided against it. I tried to take a more civil approach and took out my phone from my pocket. I was about to dial her number when I was disturbed by one of the she-wolves from my pack. Anna was right. People from my pack, especially the she-wolves, have started taking things for granted and have been disrespectful to the leaders. Good evening, Alpha. I am here to help you relax. I know you are stressed, and I am here to satisfy your needs and fulfill your desire, she said in a seductive whisper with a smirk on her face. I have always been in trouble because of situations like this. These whores throw themselves on me, and I accept them with open arms, so they have gotten ahead of themselves. To be honest, I am beyond pissed at this moment, as I realize that by letting this whore near me, I am not taking what I want, but I am giving them what they want. Just the realization was enough to spike my anger, and a frustrated growl escaped my lips. Stay the fuck away from me. Let me make this clear, that I don't want a whore like you near me, and pass this message to the other whores in the pack as well. No one is allowed on the ninth and tenth floor without permission from the leaders. If I see any one of you here, I am going to snap their heads then and there itself. Do you understand? I yelled at her. She flinched, jumping away, and she nodded her head yes, frantically shaking her head, running down the stairs. I desperately wanted to punch something or someone. I took a long, deep, relaxing breath to calm myself, but I was still pissed. I pulled my phone out and dialed Sai's number, and she answered after the third ring. What do you want? She asked as soon as she answered. Good evening to you, sis. I replied sarcastically, and I can imagine her rolling her eyes at me. What do you want? She asked again, making me sigh. <sighs> do you know where Anna is? She was supposed to be taking it easy and rest, but I can't find her anywhere. I asked, coming straight to the point. There are people taking care of her, so you don't have to pretend to care for her. She replied coldly. Sigh, for God's sakes. You know I am not pretending here, and I am really worried about her, so stop playing with me and tell me where she is, I asked more sternly. She is an alpha, you know. She went to meet her pack to say thank you for their wishes and talked about something. She would come back in some time, she replied, and for some reason I feel like she is hiding something from me. What is it that you're hiding from me? I asked, not beating around the bush. Chapter 30 Part B Gavin's Point of View I'm not hiding anything. I told you whatever was for me to tell you. The rest is between you and Anna. She said, disconnecting the call before I could say anything to her. I was already pissed, and Anna starting work as soon as she came out of the hospital when she was supposed to take rest. I was almost at the verge of losing it. Brian wanted to see his mate, and I wanted to see her too. I can't wait for her to come back to see if she was okay. I pushed the button on the elevator and entered inside as soon as the door opened 
pressing the button to go to the ground floor. I was trying to calm myself down, but nothing was helping me, and I was really pissed at a lot of things. The elevator dinged, indicating that I reached the ground floor. I walked out of the elevator, and I was about to walk out the front door when I saw my mate walking up to the door. I immediately calmed down after finding out she was okay, but I must look different because she looked at me differently, and before I could say anything, I heard a baby cry, only to find myself looking at a small bundle of joy in her arms. She cooed softly at the baby as he calmed down, and I immediately softened at the sight of the baby. I linked her that we have to talk, but she didn't want to talk and said she had to take her kids inside. I realized she must have adopted the baby, and I couldn't hold in my excitement when she said yes. I wanted to ask her why she didn't tell me anything. I could have gone with her. But before I could ask anything, Anna looked down. I followed the movements of her eyes to find myself looking at a cute little girl, tugging at my mate's arm, looking at her curiously. She called her mommy and asked who I was. I was so excited that I couldn't stop myself from telling her that I am her daddy. She looked at Anna with questionable eyes, and when she said yes, she asked me questions. I answered them the best I could and scooped her in my arms. I saw a truck parking in the driveway. Anna instructed them to move the stuff to her floor and set the room up for the kids. I wanted to ask and say so many things, but I couldn't look away from the little girl in my arms. I have always wanted kids, but I didn't know that you instantly get an instinct of a father for kids who are not blood, and judging with the way Anna is looking at them with so much joy in her eyes, I can say she feels the same way. When Dan walked to us with his mate, he also had a little girl in his arms, and with the way his smile never left his face, I could tell that his little daughter had him wrapped around her little fingers, and I don't think I am any different from him. I was even more surprised that both Brian and Elsa have accepted the children as their pups. It's very rare that your wolf spirit accepts other pups as their own because of their wild and feral nature. I know one thing for sure that these two will have a special place in our hearts, because we may not be related by blood, but we are bonded to each other by heart, because they are the one who gave us the beautiful feeling of being parents. They are the first ones to call us mom and dad. Even when we have our own kids in the future, these two will be our firstborns, and they will have equal rights on everything we have. I heard Brian growling in approval at my thoughts, and a smile spread across my face that finally we agreed on something without a fight. I walked to the ninth floor with the kids, and once everyone was settled, I found out that Dan is moving here to keep Anna company, and for once, I'm a little relieved because she just got out of the hospital, and with having our kids home, she will have her hands full. I am really disappointed because I would not be with her to help her with the kids, but no one can stop me from being with the kids. I am going to try and help her as much as I can with the kids by giving her the space she needs. Anna walked to the kitchen to cook for everyone as her beta Bria ordered pizza. I tried my best to get her to talk to me, but she didn't. We all ate our food. Anna first fed Eric, and then she had her food. After dinner, we had a formal round of introduction with the kids, so they know us and each other. Then everyone started leaving for their rooms for the night. I walked behind my mate to see her putting the kids to sleep in her bed with a wall of pillows so they don't fall. I could have been the one to sleep on the other side of the bed with my family, I felt my heart being squeezed inside my chest at the thought of it. It was really painful. I walked to the kids, placing a kiss on their foreheads 
walking to the door. I waited at the door for some time, hoping that maybe she would ask me to join them on the bed, but she didn't. I sighed, walking out of the room with a heavy heart. I walked up straight to my room. I had a lot to think about. I know I want her, but she is right. I can't hurt her. I have to sort my feelings out so I can come to a decision of what I must do or what I really want. I know I can't, and I am not letting her go away from me, and I will do whatever it takes to keep it that way. But I think we do need some space to sort out our feelings, but I am still not letting her out of my sight, no matter what. I removed my clothes, staying in my boxers, as I settled on my bed with all the emotions and feelings coming to surface again. I pushed them away, closing my eyes, falling asleep, and the last conscious thought in my head was my maiden kids. Chapter 31 Eliana's Point of View It has been a few days since we brought the kids home. It still feels different every time I realize that I am now a mother to two beautiful children. It's like I have everything, but still, something seems to be missing from my life. When I got out of the hospital, I never thought I could have a normal daily life schedule again. But here I am, living a normal life with my kids. It did take some time to get used to the feeling of being a parent, but every effort is worth it when I see the smile on their faces. The day after we brought the kids home, we had our parents visit us to meet their grandkids, and just like us, they instantly fell in love with them. They told us that they wanted to move in and stay with us so they can have their grandkids close to them. I have never seen any of them so excited before this. They asked me to make arrangements on my floor. All four of them wanted to stay with me and the kids, but I couldn't let a family break just because my mate has wronged me. It took a lot of convincing for Uncle Blake and Aunt Bella to get them to stay on the tenth floor. We negotiated, and I told them they could visit us any time they wanted to, or take the kids with them to stay with them sometimes. Finally, they agreed, and I asked Sai to get a room ready for her parents, and she happily obliged. Life has become even more easier with the help we got from the old people moving in to stay with us. They helped us learn a lot of things about parenting, and I couldn't help but be grateful for their advice and help. The most surprising part was Gavin was giving me the space I wanted, but he was still around all the time as if keeping an eye on me. He was always there ready to help with anything our pups needed. For once... I was glad that at least he's a good father, and our pups enjoyed his company. I haven't felt any pain since I got out of the hospital. I once thought that maybe Elsa is taking it all alone to keep the pain away from me, but she said that she didn't feel anything. I had to make her promise me that she will not suffer alone, in case of anything if that happens. She said that Brian keeps contacting her and he said Gavin hasn't done anything after that day and that he is trying to give us space, but I still don't trust him. If he has really realized his mistake, then he will have to prove his worth, and I am not the one to become the damsel in distress to let him be my knight. Yes, I have emotions, and there are times when I am vulnerable, but I will not be vulnerable in front of a person who doesn't deserve to know about my feelings. Dan told me that he has a meeting with Gavin about the threats that are looming around our packs, and they think that the rogues and vampires are working together. He said that they think they are looking for something, and they have already sent scouts and trackers to get information so we can learn what we are dealing with. He said that they have called for a meeting with all the alphas of the packs around our territory, and everyone has arrived. We are about to start the meeting in a few hours. We have made arrangements for the Alphas on the 8th floor, as the ninth and 10th floor are our private floors, and we don't want to let anyone other than our family in. 
which also means that in the meeting, I am not only an Alpha, but also a Luna. We can't let the other Alphas know about the issue we have, so we will have to behave normally in front of everyone. It is our private matter, and I would like to keep it that way. This is an important meeting, and I have some paperwork to complete before the meeting starts. I walked up to my floor after my daily morning run, walking to the nursery only to find Uncle Blake and Uncle David playing with the kids. I smiled entering the room as I felt Gavin's presence behind me. What the hell? Was he following me? I thought, and Elsa rolled her eyes, saying that I am only losing my memory and that he comes every day at the same time to play with the kids before he starts his work for the day. I ignored her comment and walked in to see Erica jumping on her bed at the sight of her father and Eric softly giggling at the faces both his grandfathers were making. Good morning. I greeted both the uncles, and they smiled at me. Good morning. They both replied at the same time and laughed with each other as my son giggled with them. Good morning, Mommy. Erica yelled, jumping in my arms, and I laughed, catching her, kissing her neck. Good morning, sweetie. What do you want for breakfast? I asked, and she smiled with excited eyes. Thank you, Mommy. Grandma's making me pancakes, she said, giving me a kiss. Little princess, you have nothing for Daddy today? Gavin asked with a pout, and she giggled loudly. She motioned her hands, asking him to come near her, and when he leaned in, she wrapped her little arms around his neck, giving him a kiss on the cheek. I love you, Daddy, and I love you, Mommy, she said with a smile on her face as my heart felt like it's going to burst out with the way she said she loves us with so much love in her eyes. I kissed her forehead, letting her play with the men. I walked out of the room as a happy tear escaped out of my eye. I smiled, wiping it away entering the kitchen, only to get kicked out by Aunt Becca and Aunt Bella. I walked back to my bedroom, only to find Gavin standing in front of the door, leaning on the wall. He stood straight as soon as he saw me, looking at me with an unreadable expression on his face. I ignored his presence and moved forward to the door as soon as my hand reached out for the knob. He cleared his throat trying to get my attention, and I looked at him, waiting for him to say what he wanted. Um, can we talk? He asked, sounding nervous. What do you want to talk about? I asked and walked up to him, but now he was trying to hold my hand, but I moved away. He looked at me with a sad expression before taking a deep breath. <sighs> about us? Please? He asked with pleading eyes. There is nothing left to talk about between us, Gavin. I said, and he shook his head, disagreeing with me. You can't say that, Anna. We are mates. Things can never be over between us. He said, and I could hear his anxiety in his voice, but I couldn't do anything about it because nothing has changed. That's what you think. I said this before, and I am saying this again. I am only carrying your mark, and I have nothing to do with you. And yes, one more thing. I believe what happened between us is for us to know, and the others don't have to find out. I don't want the other packs or other members to know anything about what happened between us. For them, we are mates, and I am your Luna. Let us just keep things the way they are and behave normally while they are here, I said, and he argued with a nod of his head as a small smile played at his lips. You are right. Others don't have to know about our personal lives. And yes, take all the time you want, Anna, but I am not letting you go, no matter what happens. We will talk about us once we sort everything out. The rogues the vampires, the pack, 
in our feelings, but while we are at it, I am still not letting you go. He said with a low growl, and I felt Brian coming to surface. I think you have to go and get ready. We have a meeting to start as soon as we have breakfast, I said, completely ignoring his statement and walking inside my room. I closed the door behind me. I sighed as I thought about what Gavin said. He said he would not let me go, and I knew long before he said that, but I am still not letting him in. I can't, after everything he has done. He has had a sudden change of heart now, and he can have a change of heart again. How can I trust him not to break my trust and heart again? He has not proved anything, and I am sure I am not letting him in so easily. I sighed as I walked inside the bathroom to shower and get ready for the meeting. Chapter 32 I had a quick shower and pulled on a pair of dark blue formal pants, light blue shirt, and matching dark blue jacket. I brushed my long purple hair and pulled it in a high ponytail. I quickly applied lip balm, eyeliner, and mascara. I applied a little of compact and blush. Once I was done, I did a once-over in the mirror, and overall, I looked beautiful and professional. This is the first formal meeting with the Alphas after we took over our packs, and we are the hosts of the meeting, so we had to make an impression. Mommy, you look beautiful, my little daughter said, walking in my room from the adjoining door from their room, and I laughed a little with how cutely she said beautiful. Thank you, sweetie. You look very pretty, too. I kissed her cheek, standing up to look at her. She was wearing a cute white top and blue shorts while her hair were tied in pigtails. Thank you, she said smiling shyly. I gave her a bright smile. Let's have breakfast, shall we? I asked, and she jumped in excitement. She grabbed my hand, dragging me out of the room, telling me how both her grandfathers helped her get ready. I walked to the dining area, picking up Erica, helping her sit on her chair. I sat down on my chair as everyone came in to have breakfast. Aunt Bella had requested me earlier to let Gavin have breakfast with us today, since she didn't have the time to get him breakfast upstairs, and we would be late for our meeting if we did that. Just then, Gavin walked in looking as handsome as ever. He wore a black dress pants, white shirt with a matching black blazer, and black formal shoes. His dark black hair were brushed and gelled to perfection. I would be damned if I tell him that. He is already full of himself, and we don't want an ego boost now, do we? Daddy, you look beautiful, Erica said, and we all laughed. Gavin shook his head, chuckling lightly. I never thought I would have my daughter tell me I look beautiful and not handsome, he said, and we laughed again but our daughter looked at us with a frown and a cute little pout on her face. Little princess, men look handsome, not beautiful, okay? He said with a soft smile on his face as Erica nodded her head, saying an okay, trying to pronounce handsome and failing miserably. All of us did our best not to laugh because we didn't want Princess Fiona to get angry. Once the kids were done with breakfast, we asked an Omega to take her to the nursery to play and asked her to watch them. Once they were out of sight, I looked at everyone, telling them about not letting anyone know about the things happening between me and Gavin. I also made it clear that irrespective of whoever our guests are, no matter how old our friendship is with them, we would not talk about our personal matters in front of them. Everyone agreed after a lot of explanation and discussions with them. Once done with breakfast, we walked down for the meeting. I asked Dan, Bria, Steve, and Cy to take care of things and come in with the scouts and trackers we sent out for information. I walked down to the ground floor with Gavin beside me. We had the pack members greeting us 
bowing their heads in respect while we responded with a nod of our head. We reached down the stairs and greeted all the alphas that have arrived for the meeting, showing them to the conference room. We were about to turn when suddenly I was lifted off the ground and I growled loudly in warning as the person who picked me up spun me around. I didn't like the feeling of having his arms around me. I wanted to rip off the person who had done this, but my eyes found Gavin's. He was shaking where he stood as his eyes turned black and he growled so loud the entire house shook as we heard whimpers of the pack members. Now I will have to calm his ass down and in front of everyone I will have to play his loving mate. I swung my legs, kicking the person in between his legs, jumping on the floor. I walked to Gavin and I immediately wrapped my hands around him, rubbing his back as he held me tightly, pulling me flush against him with his head in the crook of my neck as he calmed down, inhaling my scent. Once I was sure he was calm enough, I pulled away and he kissed my head, turning me around, keeping his arms tightly secured around my waist, and I looked at the person who was responsible for this. My eyes landed on the figure, groaning on the floor. I couldn't see his face, and I growled at him in a warning. He slowly lifted his head to look at me, and I identified him as the Alpha of the Night Howler's Pack, Evan. We have been friends when we were kids, and he was like a brother to me, but he had other intentions and proposed to me when I was fifteen, just before my parents' death, and I had clearly told him that I'm not interested and that I want my mate and no one else. But just like Gavin, he doesn't understand the meaning of no. I glared at him, and he sent a smile my way, but it dropped as soon as he saw Gavin's arms wrapped around me, and his expression changed from a happy smile to a frown, then confusion, and then finally settling on anger as he growled lowly, and I growled back louder in response. What the hell do you think you were doing? You have no right to touch me, I growled loudly. Come on, Marie, don't be like that. Did you forget we were friends when we were kids? And why are you standing with him, having his arms around you? He asked, and I felt Gavin stiffen behind me. You said it yourself, that we were friends, and we are not anymore because you were not interested in friendship. I am not answerable to you and I don't think I need anyone's approval here to stand with my mate on my own territory. I replied, and Gavin relaxed a little, but he still glared at Evan like he could kill him with the first opportunity he gets, and I would too. You found your mate? Evan asked, wide-eyed, making a smirk appear on my face. Yes, I did. I remember telling you that I will, and I did, I said and Gavin gave me a kiss on the cheek. I think he's taking PDA to another level now, but I can't do anything because all the alphas have gathered around looking at the alpha male on the ground who got his ass beat by an alpha female because he tried to touch her without her permission. I saw some alphas sending glares his way, and he looked down knowing that he has embarrassed himself and not me. I am a woman and I demand respect. If I can't forgive my mate for his mistakes, then he is nowhere near getting any for coming near me without my approval. He got up from the floor, dusting himself, muttering a small sorry to me, entering the conference room, making me roll my eyes. We requested all the alphas to get settled inside the conference room while we welcomed the others. It took us a good thirty minutes by the time all the alphas arrived. We had more than fifty packs in the country, ours being the largest two packs, not only in numbers, but in strength, riches, and everything. We have around forty-five alphas visiting us for the meeting, which means that the problem with the rogues and vampires is bigger than we first thought. We did a formal round of introductions with all the packs and alphas available in the room, all the while 
Evan was glaring at me, making me growl in warning. As soon as the growl left my mouth, he looked away, and we continued with the introductions. Once the introductions were done, we informed that we have accommodated all the alphas on the eighth floor and betas and other pack members in the guest house beside the pack house. All the alphas looked quite impressed with all the arrangements so far and with how beautiful our pack house looked. We thanked them gratefully, and once we were done with the basics, we started the meeting. We wanted to talk about the troubles they were facing and what they think of the situation before we tell them about what we think and why. They told us that the smaller packs were having more frequent attacks than the bigger ones and that they escaped before they could capture any one of them. Once they were done, Gavin and I looked at each other, and he nodded for me to start. All right, gentlemen. We think that the rogues and vampires are working together, I said, as they gasped at my revelation, looking at us with wide eyes. Chapter 35 Gavin's Point of View it had been a stressful few days after my last encounter with my mate, which was a couple of days ago when I brought Erica and Eric home. I have given her the space that she said she wanted, and I have tried my best to not bother her because I need to sort myself out too before I could decide what to do with myself and how to win my mate back. Today's the day of the meeting where all the alphas of the country are going to be present. It's the first meeting we have hosted as the new leaders of the pack. We have ensured everything was the way it should be. I had breakfast with everyone today, where my daughter said I looked beautiful, and we all chuckled at her cuteness. Anna informed everyone that we don't want other packs to know about our differences, and to my surprise, everyone supported her decision. After breakfast, when we went downstairs to welcome our guests, one of the invited alphas lifted my mate up without her permission, and boy was she pissed. I would have found it extremely hot if I was already having trouble holding Brian back. Anna kicked the alpha in the balls and comforted me to calm me down. I know it was because everyone was there, and she was trying to do what any other mate would have done, but somewhere deep inside my heart... It also gave me hope that we might be able to keep our differences aside and live a normal life like every other couple. But I know for that, we have to sort ourselves. Once I was calm, we started the meeting, and after the living arrangements were sorted, we addressed all the alphas and handled the situation very well despite our nerves. However, there was something wrong with this Evan guy because he was trying everything with the help of his friends to make us believe that there is nothing wrong and these were normal rogue attacks. Something is so very wrong with this man, because I don't like the way his eyes keep staring at my mate in a weird way that makes Brian alarmed, as if he is trying to take our mate away from us. The thought itself has my blood running cold, and thankfully... Anna is also not a fan of Evan, and she seems to hate his guts. From what I can understand, they both have history, because from what I heard, they used to be childhood friends. It was something Evan did that made Anna break away from him, breaking their friendship in the process. Our pack tracker's leader came back with information, just in time, and we were able to make everyone know the criticality of the situation. All the packs agreed to help us, but I don't trust Evan and his friends, which makes a total of three packs out of our ally list. I was surprised when after strategy discussions and everything to ensure we keep our packs safe, Anna very carefully handled the situation that we will be getting in touch with the Alphas if we get any more details or any threats that come our way. I think even she doesn't trust Evan and wants to keep him and his friends away from future meetings or discussions. I internally heaved a sigh of relief when I knew that Evan would be away from this, and I am sure that if we keep him away, there wouldn't be any more threats. 
but I am going to dig information about him. I will have to do it for my satisfaction to ensure that my mate, pups, family, and pack are safe. Once the meeting was completed, Anna gracefully invited everyone for dinner. We were waiting till all the alphas were out of the room and headed to the main dining room. The only ones left in the room were our betas, my mate, and me. Anna explained to them that she purposely said that because she doesn't trust Evan just like I thought. Bria was confused, but Dan caught on to what we meant and explained it to Bria. Anna said something about Evan doing something, and I wanted to ask her what it was, but I had to bite my tongue to keep myself from asking her questions and making her think that I am trying to overpower her. Dan suggested that we can contact the Alphas through their betas, and no one would suspect us because we clearly said that we were going to call the Alphas once we have the information. After we were done with the discussion, Anna walked out of the room with Dan and Bria trailing behind her. I saw her moving to the direction of the kitchen while Dan and Bria went the other way. I walked out of the room following behind my mate. She looked deep in thought, and both of us noticed Sophie walking in the room, and then she was pulled in Alpha Nathan's arms as he growled loudly, staking his claim on his mate, and I recalled how I reacted when I found Anna, especially when I saw her with Dan first, and then Stephen. I was jealous, and I didn't even realize that I was being ridiculous, and now I feel like laughing at myself. I saw Anna smile to herself and turning to go into the kitchen, and as far as I know her, she is going to help the Omegas and pack members with lunch. She truly has all the traits and skills that a good Alpha and Luna should have in them, and I feel kind of stupid to hurt her the way I did. At this point, I don't know what is right or what is wrong. The only thing I know is that I want my mate, my pups, and my family with me. I saw Anna stopping in her tracks as soon as she turned, and standing in front of her was Evan, and my hands itched to strangle him there as Brian clawed at me wanting to come out. The way he smirked at her made Brian let out a snarl, and I could feel anger bursting through me. And it was not only my emotions that I felt at this moment, but there were also Anna's emotions drowning me in them making it difficult for me to breathe for a second as I struggled to understand which emotions were mine, which were hers, but I couldn't differentiate between them. What do you want, Evan? Anna growled at him, and his smirk widened as another growl escaped her lips. I can feel her wolf alarmed with his presence, and so was mine as he wanted nothing more than to snap the alpha's neck. We need to talk, Evan said, as if he was speaking to an old friend. You don't get to order me around because you are no one to me and there is nothing that I want to talk to you about, Anna said as a threatening growl escaped her lips. Come on, Eliana, for old time's sakes, we are friends, he pleaded as Anna sent a death glare his way. We are not friends, and there is no old time's sakes. Stay the fuck away from me. I am really happy with my life. I have my mate, my family, and my pack that needs my attention. You are no one to deserve anything. She yelled at him, and his face darkened. You think your little mate is going to be able to fight with me if I challenge him? He doesn't deserve you, Anna. I do. I have waited so long for this moment, and I don't want anyone else. No one but you. I can prove that to you, because I rejected my mate as soon as I found her. He shot back, and Anna's eyes widened for a split second at his confession. You are really out of your mind. You're nothing but a jerk who didn't value the most precious thing the moon goddess gave you. Irrespective of what you do, you will never be the one I want. It has 
and will always be my mate that I want to be with. As far as the challenge is concerned, I would like to see you try, because I know that my mate is way more stronger than you are, and you don't stand a chance to stand anywhere near him. He would kill you in a blink of an eye. Now listen to me very carefully. If you want to stay alive, then stay the fuck away from me, or I might be the one to snap your neck even before Gavin can get his hands on you. The meeting is over, so I suggest you get out of our pack's land and your pack and your friends before I inform the other packs of what you were intending to do. She shouted at him, and fuck the way she took charge, the way her face turned red in anger, and the way her eyes held so much authority. It aroused me, making me want her even more. What the fuck is wrong with me? I shook my head to clear my head and snap myself out of my dirty thoughts, because this is not the right time or right place to get aroused. Just when she was going to the kitchen again, Erica came running to Anna with a bright smile on her face. Mommy, Grandma wants us to eat lunch together, she said and immediately both our expressions softened, and Anna picked our daughter in her arms as I walked to them. Ma, mommy Evan asked, shocked. His eyes went as wide as saucers. She is my mommy, Erica said, kissing Anna's cheek. Daddy? Erica yelled as soon as she saw me coming to them, and threw herself in my arms once I reached them and kissed my cheek. Hey, little princess, did you eat already? I asked as she shook her head. No, Grandma said we will eat together, she said again, and I smiled, planning a kiss on her head. I turned to face the man that has been doing nothing but making us angry since he arrived. Alpha Evan, I assume my mate has already said goodbye to you. I said as he huffed, walking out of the pack house, and after a few minutes we saw his friends joining him outside. Once we were sure that they left, we made our way towards the main dining hall to have dinner with our family. Neither me or Anna said anything about Evan, while Erica kept on chatting about her new doll. We walked in and sat down at the dining table, where our family was waiting for us, as the Omegas served lunch.